stuff. But if we want to receive compensation, especially with copyright, there's a lot more involved in it, market value, where it's being used, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to have that documentation so we can start to back up the claim that we're making. Because you can, just can't go to the copyright office and say, oh, it was $20,000 that I would have been paid for that. They're going to like prove it. I want to know that you can prove this. Um, so just to reiterate all of these, you know, not just for your own business purposes, it's really important to keep track of all that sort of stuff. So. Right, right. And, and you know, artists really have to take this seriously and be a business. Yeah, I was going to say, when I checked with one of our, um, we have these commercial field underwriters, so they're out every day just evaluating risks, things like that. There's a great guy I work with named Matt, and I was asking him about ensuring um, completed artwork. And he said that the policy language prevents profiting from your own work or product. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're having a horrible uh, event at the Ann Arbor Art Fair, and you go, well, I'm just going to torch my whole <laughs> booth. And, Right. Well, it's up for ten thousand dollars, so now that's what I want. So that's what they're trying to prevent, because obviously there's a lot of fraud in the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. Sure, everybody watching today are, are very good people, but there's some not so good are. people. Out there. We're going to take our last question about commercial insurance, and then we're going to move on because we have a lot of really, really important things to talk about. Uh, James Boyk, hi, James. James asked, and this is something else, Dave. You and I talked about earlier. Wouldn't having an LLC take away the lot? the liability from your personal money. So what James is talking, well, do you want to, do you want to answer this question, Dave, and just talk a well, tad about L an LLC? Yeah. And, and yeah, we talked about this a little bit that does protect you personally, but it doesn't protect the LLC. So the LLC still needs to have insurance. And, mm -hmm. and some of these clients that I've talked about, I'm not insuring them individually. I'm sure insuring their business. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you know, one of the things that I've mentioned before, Andrea, and other things that, where I've spoken for you is you're not always entirely protected by an LLC. And this happened to me personally, because I've owned probably, you know, eight or nine different businesses. And I had one business where I, I, when I was younger, it, very stupidly, I commingled my personal funds with the business funds, even though the business, it was an S corporation. So there should have been that protection. Mm -hmm. And then somebody sued, uh, me personally for the business and the lawyer pointed out that they had what they call pierced the corporate veil because I had commingled personal funds with the business funds. I was acknowledging that I actually was that business. Oh, okay. So, so they were entitled to everything then, huh? Yeah. They, they were after, able to go after me personally as well. So I never, never make that mistake. If you set up an LLC, you keep your personal funds completely separate from that. And never commingle the two. And, and that means really, being right. a business and really being business minded, you know, with, with your art business. We're going to move on to the second question. And I, I want to, again, thank Damien for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Damien. Hello. With this new, hi. With this new normal, unfortunately, of limited interaction and more online communications and connections, can you tell us more about technology trends for artists? Well, I don't know if they're in any way limited to coronavirus and the current uh, crisis we're going under, but just my personal, I am not an artist, so um, I'm, a, I'm an attorney. I've worked with many, many artists when I was at Ford. I worked with the design staff there. My wife used to work in college for creative studies, and I know all of the artists and you know, our professors there or people that have graduated from there and set up successful businesses, so I'm not an artist. Um, my wife, uh, I was fortunate enough that she escorted me uh, to a bunch of cool places. And part of those things like uh, uh, the uh, Biennale in Venice or the Art Basel in Miami, I actually see the um, the evolution of art from a static, this is a painting which, or a sculpture which is there for 10,000 years to this is moving art uh, and subject to digital rights management are really impressive. There's a, an Israeli company that is uh, at the forefront of this new type of transformation called Neo and the uh, marketing of art through digital means um, is, is really taking off where artists can now sell digitally like songwriters and their art is displayed on moving screens. They've got audio component and they're going to allow for texture. They're going to allow for smells. They're going to allow for all kinds of sensory interactions. So these digital right management elements is going to be included. It's a completely new avenue for artists to, uh, to enter into that space. There'll be more 
like songwriters or movie producers or you know photographers um, you know than in, in the traditional sense of, of uh, artists like sculptors or painters uh, but I, you know from a technological standpoint that's yet another um, avenue that the copyright office uh, is protected so you can protect all forms of artistic expression as long as it's fixed in the tangible media um, so it doesn't really matter how it's created as long as it's reproducible so a couple of things you know like fountains and um, you know uh, fireworks are the last vestiges of things that you can't protect because they're kind of gone uh, after you're done with the art but almost everything else you can protect but you said that you can protect tangible image, uh, tangible product, correct? As well, you know, it, so let's go back historically. You could paint on a rock wall and that is protected as soon as the caveman put an image on a wall. As soon as that brush struck the wall, it's protected. So you don't have to register it. So there's two types, two thinking of copyright. One is the, um, copyright itself, which is created as soon as the artist fixes it in the tangible medium of expression, pen to paper, paint to canvas, digital image to memory card. Uh, and then there's registration. So in the United States and virtually everywhere around the world, you are not required to register your copyright. You are some to registering your copyright primarily in terms of documenting it especially if you've got a, a, a transition from person a to person b you're selling it from company a to company b or it's required if you're going to enforce it against an infringer those are three common reasons why you would register it you register those things online through the copyright office at copyright.gov the fees for filing it vary based on the type and if you're filing just one image or a collection of images, but they're in the hundreds of dollars. Once you do the first couple, you don't really need to have an attorney do it. Um, what you really need is strategy for why you're filing it, why you're registering it, and when you would register it. So if in, you're in the software space, it's frequently registered when you have a major release, when you go from a, a, a 1.0 to a 2.0, and it's frequently also included when you are transitioning ownership from company A to company B, or you purchase a significant uh, module from a supplier, something like that. Is, is your office available, of course now by phone, for artists that have questions about how to copyright? Is that something that you do at your office? Do you, do you help guide us? Um, one, we do basic intellectual property instruction. I'm not a copyright attorney. The um, uh, Patent and Trademark Office, uh, it, we issue patents and trademarks. We advise the administration and the president on all copyright matters. There is a specific office that used to be headed by a woman from the city of Detroit. Her name was uh, Karen Temple, but she moved on. I forgot who the current register is. Um, but we would certainly point you in that direction, and if you had some simple questions, we could answer them. If you had more complex questions, we could put you in touch with experts in the copyright office. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, good. Um, thank Can you. I, sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I think one thing that uh, Damien said, I just want to reiterate, is that um, for artists, the primary benefit of registering copyright is that unless you do that, it's very difficult or impossible to claim damages for the reuse of that image. And especially on the web these days, things can be pulled. So I, D Damien's right that once we click the shutter or we put the paint on the canvas, the copyright is technically ours. But if you go to court, and yeah. you don't have that image or any of that registered, you're not going to get any money for the uh, for the use on that. That's what the real importance of registering the copyright itself is. Right. Uh, you, can't even file, file the same thing. you can't even file your complaint without a registration. Okay, there yeah. you go. And through the copyright office, Andrea sent you a couple links, and maybe we can send that out. There's a... Uh, uh, copyright Alliance, which is really just uh, that gives information to artists and 
for her trademarking all of it. It has a really because the through the Library of Congress, this changes all the time. The number of images you can uh, copyright at a time, the cost of it. And also what's really important is the time frame from when the image or the work is created and when you register the copyright itself will kind of determine whether or not you can file for damages. So again, this is getting into an area with artists that uh, is very specific and very business oriented. But the main takeaway is that if you don't register, you won't be able to get anything for the infringement of your work itself. Right. So I know that when you create something tangible, like uh, a book or a poem, and you mail it to yourself, you don't open it. You have that date stamp, that, that stamp, because you go uh, through the post office. The that poor man's of, copyright. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is there no, nothing online, is there, are there no time stamps digitally that we can take advantage of? I mean, Not I can't in not mind. in that way not in the way you're talking about it. and i don't even know if that would be valid anymore really um you know that would probably be more an idea or a, a design for something you can't email yourself your own work and say that now it's copyrighted to me because cool. the library of congress is going to need to go and say yes this has been registered underneath this individual at this time within the given time frame for registration which is generally two to three weeks after creation of that in order for these damages to go through. We're, we're throwing it into a huge bureaucracy and unfortunately they need to be able to track that uh, for the damages. So I really wouldn't. Now, if you patent the new vacuum cleaner and you have the design and you mailed it to yourself, maybe, I mean, that's Damien's world. Maybe yeah. that would work, but I wouldn't trust it, honestly. That's you're you're looking at evidence of first creation and, and those, are, those are just evidence. It's just a tool of like in the old days we used to have found notebooks that were signed by a witness. So those are tools to establish use. I wouldn't mix up those records of when things were created with the underlying business or legal objective you're trying to create. So if you're trying to say, I did this, not my partner, not my co-inspiration, not my roommate, not my blankety blank, um, those that will assist you in solving that challenge. So. If, you know, a far bigger challenge I think most artists would have is um, if they had a co-author, a co-creator, employees. Right, which brings a far up bigger risk. Wax, right, like like dual copyright and how do you navigate that? Or in the movie industry, because there's dual copyrights all over the place with that. Like someone does the music, someone does this, but it's all a part of a compilation. Then we're dealing with multiple copyrights. That's a far, far, far bigger issue than who wrote what on what day. You're, exactly. Most exactly. of the tools, you know, any kind of the new modern day um, uh, file management tools have very good records of creation. So I can't imagine anybody's not using a, a cloud-based backup system for anything important anyway. So, right. right. Yeah, there was a question that just came in, Andrea. Yep, we and got two questions actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. The artist about the when they put the copyright on their image, no, that doesn't that doesn't hold water at all. Well, you oh, can okay. put you can put a cop a circle C uh, with your name on it and the date, and that does put people on notice, but it does not give you the ability to enforce that copyright. It's really a notice that that okay. is your work. So you okay. can do that the day you take a photograph or write a book or. Do a painting you could put circle c on it with your name and the date yeah so um, i think i think that there's a distinction here in the question that yes whenever you create it it is copyrighted to you there's no question about that in any way shape or form the thing is that unless you register you can't file for damages for misuse that's so true you can sue anybody for anything so yes well, Right. So once you put that C on there, I mean, you could probably try to go through legal proceedings, but it's not going to hold up. Yes, the copyright belongs to you. You, you can't sue people without registration. All that you're doing is if there is an image or a work and it says Circle C, Damien Picari 2020, whoever has that image cannot argue that they didn't know it was copyrighted. So you're removing right. their ability to say they are you know, a bona fide purchaser without notice. So right. if the work is copyrighted and has a label on it, you've destroyed their good faith 
uh, statement that they didn't know was copyrighted. Right. So exactly. Having that on there alone without registering, you can't file for it. But if you have that on there and it's registered, then when you go then to the then you're covered. lawsuit, yes. there's very little that person can say that they, they can't say, I didn't know that I was stealing a copyright image. So your case will be that much stronger sure. and it's greater potential for damages awarded to you. Right. Now, again, we get into the, you need to be able to prove what those damages are. You can't go in and say it's worth $100,000 unless you know what distribution is, what website is it on, uh, what's the pockets of those people. You need to have all that background information in order to justify, yes, my photograph in this commercial sense used on a website generated this much income for these people. Therefore, I'm allotted a $10,000 licensing fee, which is on par with industry standard for the use of that particular image given this context. So there's a lot you need, kind of need to be keeping track of in there. Um, we have a couple questions, more questions about copyright, but I want to get to Steve and then we're going to come back to copyright because he brought up something earlier when he was sending me his topics. and. I would love for you to get into trade secrets to tell artists what they are and why we should care. Yeah, it was uh, this was a strange thing that happened to me with uh, with a uh, attorney client of mine some years ago. Uh, we were going through one of my portfolios, and he happened to see some illustrations that I had done, and said something to the tune of, "I've never seen anything like this before." And I jokingly said, "Well, it's you know ancient Chinese secret or whatever." I said. And uh, I, he said something like, well, you should make that a trade secret. And I'd never heard of anything like that before. But I guess it's something along the lines of the 11 herbs and spices or Coca-Cola's secret formula. Um, while it isn't exactly a copyright, it is intellectual property that gives you a competitive edge over your, over your competition, I guess. Uh, and it's something that you can protect reasonably so i i, I have the paper process, right here the process the, of yeah. the creation rather than the yeah. creation itself a, a piece of information that has independent economic value by not being generally known and can reasonably be maintained as a secret so there's the long-haired version of uh of what it is i guess uh, but it, in my personal case, uh, the genie was already out of the bottle. Um, I uh, developed a technique that I believed was my own. Um, I allowed it to be published in several books uh, back in the early 90s. Like a, I was a dumb kid. I was, I was in my early 20s. I did a, a dumb thing. But I was trying to be cool and share my, uh, share my knowledge with people. And it was a mistake. But, uh, you know, live and learn. Um, so what would, you the time, yeah. what would you do differently now? At this time, I would do what I would tell everybody that has a question along the side of this screen here. Get an attorney. Get an attorney and, and pay them handsomely. Um, I am deliriously happy with my attorneys and the ones that have helped me with my, uh, with my creative projects. Um, I... Uh, it's been it's been the, one of the best decisions I've ever made for not just my business but as a creative as well. Um, I mean, all the stories, all the uh, uh, topics that I sent you, Andrea, they all ended with the same thing. The moral of the story is get an attorney. Yeah, and we have an, actually an intellectual property and copyright uh, yeah. protection attorney on Embrace Creative. She's here and uh, she works for a big firm. Uh, I think she's based in Southfield. And Damien, you're shaking your head. You know well, what? Yeah. Um, I can't give legal advice. So on, on your <laughs> on your trade secret, yeah. you don't register those with anybody. You keep those secret. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you that most trade secrets are lost the old-fashioned way. Um, employees are the biggest, um, yes. by far, the yes. biggest source that. of loss of trade mm -hmm. secrets. And um, when you have you know, partners, business partners, employees, and that person created the secret, most of those people think that it's quote their secret. You know, mm -hmm. I was sitting there. Yes, you paid me, but I was the one that came up with the new paint formula, the new glass blowing technique, the That's new camera, blah blah blah. Huh. So, if you don't have a clear ownership to the secret, no judge is going to give you an injunction that stops someone from doing something. 
So imagine, you know, the, the, the harm that you're suffering. So you need to, let's construct something. Let's, let's say glass blowing, right? That's, you know, um, lots of secrets in the glass blowing arts. Um, been to Venice a bunch of times and they've been doing this stuff for going on 800 years, but there's still secrets to the trade. Um, you know, the people that created the secrets are frequently not the owners of the glass studios, it's the artists that are working to create these techniques. Um, I would doubt that those guys have uh, employment agreements, but maybe they do. Um, so what you're looking for is an employee that came up with some new, really super cool glass that's selling like hotcakes, says, hey, instead of me getting paid 50 grand a year making glass, why don't I quit, open up my own studio and sell this glass? Um, the only thing that's gonna prevent you from doing that is a very clear employment agreement and a recognition by the artist that this is not regular routine information known in the industry by all glass blowers, but is instead treated as a trade secret that you, the, the owner of the business, um, either created and and bestowed upon them as a practitioner where you paid him to invent it. So if the guy's an hourly worker at McDonald's who came up with the secret sauce, you as an owner are probably not going to be able to get that. Whereas if you went to some culinary school and said, here's millions of dollars, I need you to create this new secret sauce that I'm gonna use everywhere in my business, then you have a better chance. So I would look at all of these cases uh, retrospectively, meaning imagine yourself in court explaining to a judge why you should get a temporary restraining order, ordering someone to not do something. Judges don't like people to not work or to other to close businesses. And so you've got to present a ridiculously compelling case with evidence that you are entitled to this extraordinary relief. Memories from 20 years ago are not going to work. Okay, I told my college roommate that the secrets to this were mine. That is not going to hold any water in court. Mm -hmm. So, super clear documentation that the people you are likely to enforce this against are on notice that it was a secret. That you treated it as a secret. You didn't have it pinned to your bulletin board as you're doing the WebEx with 50 people looking at it. Okay, so if I had the secret of Coca-Cola behind me on this video conference, I would lose my secret. You have to demonstrate to a judge that you treated it as a secret. So those are just some of the thoughts that you should have if you have a business secret. And the the book that uh, James is pointing out in the uh, in the comments, the Graphic Artist Guild Handbook of Pricing and Ethical, Ethical Guidance is excellent. It's a great resource. So uh, anyone that uh, is in the graphic arts, uh, photography and such, get that book. It's fantastic. Thank so. you. Thanks, James. And Hannah says, I'm currently a student, an art student, and not yet in a position of putting work out there or generating profit from my work. At what point in someone's professional growth process is it a good time to start looking mm -hmm. for an attorney to protect one's artwork? <laughs> when you can pay them. <laughs> yeah. Right. When you yeah. pay them exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, that was a joke. Uh, Michigan does have pro bono intellectual property services. It is far more in the patent and trademark space than in the copyright space. Mm -hmm. The number of Michigan copyright lawyers is, you know, few, and one of them just passed away. Howard Abrams at University of Detroit. Um, so you most. Intellectual property attorneys have a passive familiarity with copyrights and, and check the Michigan State Bar website for access to intellectual property pro bono. Like I said, it's 90% patents and 10% trademarks and whatever's left, which is not much, is in the copyright space. Right. And like I said, we do have a, a copyright protection attorney on Embrace Creatives. Uh, you can email me. I'll get you connected to her. And um, she's really a doll. If you ask her a question, I'm sure she'll just respond. I mean, obviously, you have to be, everyone has to be conscious 
that we are all business people and we deserve to be paid just like you deserve to be paid. But, um, you know, asking a, a specific question, you, you will probably get an answer with that. Without can you ask Hannah if she's well, like, what kind of art is it? Is it photography or is it video? Is it sculptural? Is it you know, kind of in general, what type of art she's looking at protecting? Hannah, what type of art? I, I think Hannah is a, uh, a, a 2D artist. Anna, if you tell us tell us what kind of art you do. Actually, while we're waiting while we're waiting for that, Hannah, I think probably the best place to start right now is just getting used to um, uh, copywriting your images now through the Library of Congress or your work in any way, any any type of work. And then if you run into a situation where you do feel infringed, that would be the point to reach out to an attorney. Uh, for right now, that's just a good business practice to get into in general, um, so I would start there. So Hannah says she's a motion design student, 2D and 3D graphics and animation. Steve, that's up your alley. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't do it as often as I used to, but yeah, that was uh, that was my thing when I worked on uh, the TV shows that I've been involved with. Yeah, um, so I don't even know, I mean, copywriting motion design and yeah well the elements of, of uh, yeah. I'm sure you created the elements uh, that are used in your designs uh, so yeah it's just as valid as any other digital form of art so right. yeah you might have used uh, and uh, you might have even used a fancy set of uh, expressions in uh, after effects that uh, that's that's more of a coding uh, than just moving stuff around uh, with keyframes, uh, you might have even developed some code uh, involved in that. That's, I think that would be considered something that might be trade secretable. I don't know. I mean, it's possible. I, I, I'm not an attorney, uh, although uh, I, I love to pay them. Um, so, <laughs> although you play one on TV, actually, I played a doctor on TV, so I get to say that line. I, wow. I am not a doctor. Hannah, Hannah, I, Hannah, I played one on TV. I literally did. So there. <laughs> so Hannah is at the very cutting edge of copyright law. Yeah. It's tr it's typically copywriting images that are repeatable and reproducible. So let's say it's a video loop and you're filling a glass. It always starts from empty to full. But modern artists interact with their environment so as people walk by the it senses there's two people there there's one person there there's a tall guy and a short guy and mm. the image is based on the environment um oh wow that that's is a, a very, yeah, that's an interesting concept that is a very cutting edge um uh, realm of copyright because the observer is the one that's in actually the part of the work itself yeah. right work. there's so a then, really company called neo n-i-i-o that's really active in that and they have a digital rights management tool that they are reselling so okay you know, there's already people in that space that are trying to figure out how to do that both sell it and protect it Okay, so that's more of a digital rights management rather than copyright itself because we're dealing with an interactive space. That's yeah, the laws are not, they're thinking okay. about it and they're recognizing the issue, so. Okay, could you copyright the concept itself then? I mean, like the overarching yeah. concept and they have all of those variables in play there or is that not possible to do? So or that's you, a different way of, go ahead. You could, you, you could copyright frames that are repeatable, so if, they oh, okay. always start with frame A and always end at frame Z. But gotcha. in between, okay. you have different frames. Um, you could copyright frame A and Z. So if you're in that space gotcha. and you are doing some kind of interactive performance oh, art. Oh, because then you're determining the course of the art. So essentially, you're part author in that, right? Yeah. So that's where the sticky part comes in? And that's okay. the icky part because... Now you're not the creator, the person observing it. Now you're into the monkey selfie case. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Oh yeah, the monkey took a picture of itself and yes, yeah. yes, right, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, love that. You're one. the really cutting edge of, of the law, and that. right, right. Uh, there was a question earlier about copywriting all of your work. Uh, just to let you know, through the copyright office, and it changes depending upon. Uh, there was something that was sent out today about. Everything going to online registration, anything that was mailed in wasn't gonna it's gonna be backlogged, no one's doing it.
but check at the Copyright Office or again, copyrightalliance.org. They have all the information that you need. But last I checked, in general, you could in one batch copyright up to 100 works. And then once you did the 100 works, the next time you sent it in, you didn't have to pay a certain fee and you could do 200. And I think they max out right around 200 in a batch of sending that. And it's really just low res JPEGs, like anything you'd use for web based. You don't need a high res image as long as it's identifiable. But I think it's 100. And then every time after that, it's 200 pieces that you can copyright in one fell swoop. So, uh, just to give you an idea of how that works. Yeah. So if, um, if you Google copyright registration photographs, um, the, the, the copyright office actually has what they call as a micro website for collections of unpublished photographs. Mm -hmm. and the current number is 750. Okay. It keeps changing. That's why I recommend going there more than taking our word for it because two years ago it was 100 and now it's 750. So that keeps changing. The way you do it, the fees associated. Uh, and, all and there's that. different rules for different types of work. So photographs have their own rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a, and I sent this to you, Andrea, but there's yeah. actually a number of um, YouTube videos that the Copyright Office produced on you know, how to register your works. Um, they actually have you know how to's that they produce, so you you can send them your links. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to share those. I'll put that in the in the resource area of the blog post when I when I put this video up. Mm -hmm. um, we have one question from Diane um, for Steve. Where did it go? There it is. And then we're going to give Dave a chance to, we're going to talk a little bit more about commercial insurance thing. We can pop back into uh, copyright. Mm -hmm. So Di Diane, Steve wants to know if you can give her an example of trade secret. She used to teach for years and part of her job was to share her techniques. So I have a feeling she's wondering. Yeah, if she, she can protect what she's, what she's been sharing. That's a really good question. I suppose it would depend on the, uh, well, like we were saying, how how much, how secretive you can be with that. But if you're sharing it with your students, That's it. I don't think you can do it. Um, no. For me personally, the, the thing that I uh, had shown this attorney buddy of mine was, a, uh, was an illustration technique that, like I said, I shared it with the world and that was a bad idea. But it was a very, it was a very strange and very unique technique at the time. Now it's been done a million times, and mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not so arrogant to say that I created this technique, but I'm the first one to allow it to be published. So, uh, yeah. So, shame on me. Um, right. So, a so, trade secret can't. I mean, if you are an artist and you're using the same technique you used to, to get your MFA, like yeah, you, I don't think you. you can that's really not do a that. secret. If yeah. you've manipulated something and created something new that that's no one else is doing. That's, that's completely different. Yeah, right. that's, that's different. another matter entirely. I, mean, I have a similar story. I developed a uh, interior lighting technique with speed lights, really small lights, yeah. and no one was really doing it that way uh, at the time. And I had some people that were working underneath me. I taught that to them, and then this guy went ahead and took all of my techniques and wrote a book and made hundreds of thousand dollars off of it. And I couldn't do squat about it because I had taught it to him. You know, so, I mean, I think, you know, this is one of those things that I think in general, it bites you in the butt later. In retrospect, you go, oh, shoot, I should have done that. But if you're going forward and you're like, okay, this is really mine, well, you know, I just, and like you, Steve, I do, if I could go back in time, I would have done it completely yeah. different, obviously. But, you know, you know, once you put it out there, even, and, and I think this is maybe the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, dark sides of uh, internet social media. We're, we want to share that stuff with people, right? Oh, I came up with a cool technique. I want people to get the recognition for it. But, you know, think about, you know, maybe you could have written a book on it and uh, trademark. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's something, yeah, you need to think about ahead of time. So, yeah. So, the Michigan Uniform Trade Secret Law says, a trade secret is information, formula, pattern, compilation, program, device, method, technique uh, that cannot be that is not generally known and is not readily ascertainable by proper means. Mm, that's not, not vague. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're lawyers, Steve. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they do. They make the world all vague, and then the insurance. Yeah. Well, they have to be a secret. I mean, yeah. you have to argue that it isn't generally known, so yeah. it can't be in a book. Right. 
Right. And um, you can't go out and ask experts and have half of them tell you how to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I put it in a book. <laughs> yeah. And I you put it in a book. Voluntarily. <laughs> right. and, I, and I taught it to six different people. Yeah. <laughs> then it's not going to fly. Yeah. No. Dave, cool. let's, um, let's jump in back into commercial insurance for a moment. Can you tell us uh, what business pursuits means and what the term going naked means? <laughs> All right. Well, we'll start off with business pursuits. That's an endorsement that can be added onto a homeowner's policy. So if you have a very small art business and, and that the, the activities and the income are incidental to your uh, regular uh, job, let's say you, you're a, a teacher somewhere, but you do some business on the side and you're doing less than $20,000 a year in revenue, uh, we can add what's called a business pursuits endorsement to your homeowner policy. So that would cover, um, the minimum is, or it, you're given $1,000 in personal property, business personal property on that, but it also provides you with liability, anywhere from 100,000 to a million dollars in liability. And it might only add $150 or so to your homeowner policy. And that's a year, not a month. That's per year, right. Um, but like I said, that's if what you're doing is incidental to your main um, job that you have. But that's not a bad way to go for people that have a little side business operating out of their home. Have you put have you put artists into that business pursuit? I have not used that yet. Nobody's quite, uh, the underwriters are a little picky about that one. I just had, a, and this was not a, um, a creative business, but I just had someone that makes... Um, called the charge controller for solar panels. So it goes in between the solar panels and the batteries. And they're only doing $16,000 a year, but the underwriters didn't understand that business. It just seemed like, well, no, we don't want to put that on a business pursuits. Policy. So it's those, those pesky underwriters that are kind of, you know, they're warriors. <laughs> That's their job. That's their job. And they do a good job. They are good. Um, going naked. Come we, on, Dave, do it. <laughs> That means just going without insurance. And um, there's a good friend that Andrew and I had who died uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Jim Miller, who created all the playground sculptures, the porpoise and the turtle that most people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And he became a real good friend of mine over about 20 years. And, um, but for a while he went naked with that business. He, was, he had some of those playground sculptures in uh, shopping malls and things like that. Well, kids would fall off of them and get hurt, they would sue the mall, they would sue the store was near, they would sue Jim. And so pretty soon his insurance premiums got very, very high. And so he just went naked. And that's one of the things that led him to sell that business is it was just you know too risky for him to go without insurance like that. Hmm. Um, so that's Can what you, that means, yeah. Well, so when an artist doesn't want to go naked anymore, can you talk about like the range of premiums? What are they looking at? I think a lot of creatives just feel that they can't afford yeah, to cover it, themselves for liability general, as well as cover their artwork. Yeah, it, it, it might be more affordable than you think. We mentioned before uh, a general liability policy for a fairly small operation. Somebody that's doing art fairs and things like that, uh, maybe creating the pieces in their home. That can be as, as little as $150 a year. That's just liability. It doesn't cover any of your inventory or your equipment, anything like that. Um, uh, moving up a little bit, I have someone that does ornamental iron work. So like big trellises and things like that, some beautiful pieces, um, that policy that covers liability and, um, that covers his equipment as well. That's $675 a year. Uh, there's a, um, small art supply shop in Royal Oak that I insure that sells supplies for cross stitching. Uh, they do custom framing there. That policy is around five hundred and fifty dollars a year. On the that's upper end, yeah, that's for a physical location. That's yeah. That's and she does not own the building though. She leases the building. Okay. I'm not sure in that, uh, but everything in it we insure. Uh,